Anyway, welcome. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, this is a talk on Kotlin. It's, uh, it's a very introductory talk. Uh, how many of you here have heard of Kotlin? Used Kotlin? OK. So hopefully, when you leave, everyone uses Kotlin. Just go back and say, boss, we're going to rewrite everything in Kotlin. Why? Because it's so awesome. There you go. That's the best reason to rewrite something, because it's awesome. I'm joking, by the way. Anyway, uh, Kotlin, give you some background. Uh, it was started by us in 2010, us being JetBrains. Um, back then, we used to, well, back then, we still, we, if you've heard of JetBrains, we make developer tools. And we've got two sides of the business. One side is mostly Java, and all of the IDEs are built with Java, and the other side is .NET. And the Java stuff is all using Java. So we make tools for all different types of technologies and languages, et cetera, but we're still using mostly Java to write it. And we needed a language. We needed a language that was a little bit more concise than what we had. We needed a language that was a little bit more expressive, um, toolable, and interoperable with all of the source code that we had, which back then was 10 years of source code. Right, right now, JetBrains is 17 years old, so we, we have a lot of legacy code. And we wanted a language that was pragmatic. Now, at the time, we looked at multiple languages. Uh, we discarded them for different reasons. Some of the things you'll see are probably very similar to Scala. And you'll ask me, why didn't you just go with Scala? Scala is not a language that is easily toolable. We know because we created tools for it. And it's not a language. And at the time, it wasn't very fast. Now it's a little bit faster, but it wasn't very fast then. And also, Scala is a very powerful language in that it allows you to do absolutely anything you want, pretty much. Uh, we thought that that could backfire at some point. So we eventually decided to create our own language. So first and foremost, Kotlin was born out of need, pretty much like all of the tools at JetBrains. It's been developed under Apache 2, uh, licensed on GitHub ever since. What is Kotlin? It's a static language. I always forget to mention that. It targets the JVM, JavaScript, and we recently announced also native. Um, so native is already the first demo technology preview is already available. You can download it. I got it running on a Raspberry Pi, which is quite nice without any of the JVM or anything, and it works quite nicely. Current state, it was released in February 15, 2016. 1.1 was released this year. That was a 1.0. We have right now that slide is outdated. In fact, this is, this is called um, GoTo is a very agile conference, right? There you go. So next time, I won't forget. Uh, we've got 40 plus developers working on Kotlin. That makes it the second largest team at JetBrains, right? JetBrains were around 700 plus people. 40, 38, 35 or so are IntelliJ IDEA. Kotlin, well, no, IntelliJ Core and then the other ones. And Kotlin is kind of like the second largest team right now at JetBrains. Right? So we have a lot invested in, in Kotlin. Over 100 committers. It's used in more than 10 products now at JetBrains. Um, any new product that we create essentially is using Kotlin. Even our new .NET IDE is written in Kotlin, Java and .NET. Who would have thought? And I don't like name dropping unless it really benefits us, so I will. Um, and so there's some external companies that are using Kotlin as well, such as Expedia, NBC News, Digital, Netflix, Amex, and uh, a few more. Okay, those are just some of them. Right, where can you use it? So anywhere, essentially. Kotlin was, you know, we create desktop tools and servers, so we created Kotlin to be able to create desktop tools and servers. But you can use it on any platform. Android, it's compatible with Java 6, so you can use it. And it's had a lot of uptake in the Android platform because of some of the new language features that it brought that Java 8 um, has brought to the JVM, but still struggling on some aspects to bring to Android. Given that it's very similar to Java, C Sharp, JavaScript, Groovy, and pretty much put every language out there except um, Brain, F, whatever. Um, it gives you a good ramp up time. So the idea wasn't to completely move away from what you know, but kind of use some of the knowledge that you know to be familiar with the language. So I can promise you that if you know Java, C Sharp, JavaScript, Scala, Groovy, all of these, you'll pick up Kotlin in no time. But that's on purpose. And interoperability, a big thing for us. We wanted a language that was interoperable with all of the code base because we just, you know, this isn't Silicon Valley that you can just shut down for six months and rewrite in JavaScript. We needed to interrupt with all of the source code that we have. 
So we play a big part in terms of making sure that everything is interoperable. How can you use it? Very, very open, right? We make developer tools. Um, obviously, we want you to use our tools, but Kotlin is extremely open. You can use it with anything you want. You can use the command line. You can use Maven, Gradle, Cobalt, which is a new build tool similar to Gradle, inspired by Gradle, built using Kotlin, Ant, IntelliJ IDEA, Android. Does anyone still use Ant? I mean, we do at JetBrains, but I'm, I thought we we're probably the only people in the world. Okay, there's two of us. Ant, Android Studio, Eclipse. We make a plugin for Eclipse. And NetBeans, we also make a plugin for NetBeans. Okay? That's it. Let's see some code. Any questions so far? Nothing. I'm so good at explaining. Nobody, nobody even has any questions. Now, oh, God. I'm sorry about that. Yes? Uh, what platforms are we targeting for native? Right now, it's got Raspberry Pi, iOS, but we're going to target iOS. We're going to target OS X. Um, and Windows, yeah, probably had some issues. Linux already, some of it works. So any, it's going through the LLVM, so anything that, um, that works on that. Um, so I don't know. Does the Flickr read here? Yeah, that, that, that's bad, right? Yeah. It's bad. Um, so... Um, I wonder if it's the, here, let's try this. Uh, if I can do something about it. That's much worse, right? Oh. Is that better? And we didn't even need a new cable. Let's make that 30. Okay. That's better, right? Cool. Awesome. So, file new project. Now, I've done this talk a couple of times, um, which is an understatement. And um, so there's various versions of it out on the web. But I always like to give my audience something new, because then it's not fair. It's not fair on you. It's not fair on me. Um, so we're going to do something slightly different. So let's do my app for Chicago. And Kotlin comes with a very small runtime, very, very small, really small, like 700K or so, uh, and a standard library. So here's Kotlin. Ignore all of those other files that was just in my source folder. So I'll say um, sample, and I create a file, type main, print line, Hello, Chicago. And that's about the only different thing you're going to see in this presentation over all of the different ones that are out there. The name Chicago. That's it. OK. I mean, come on. What did you expect me to? No, I'll, I'll do some things in different orders, and that way it'll be slightly different. OK? So I'll run that. And hopefully, if that compiles, we'll get Hello, Chicago. There you go. Fantastic, right? Don't hold back your emotions either. Um, and of course, you can debug as well. And I can do things like you know, introduce a variable here and say variable message, and then set a breakpoint on that and debug this and get all of the stack traces and everything. So essentially, you get all of the refactorings and all of that out of the box, right? You get all of that um, with Kotlin. The tooling is top notch, trust me. I'm not biased, but I know. By the way, I work for JetBrains. OK. so. One of the things that you're going to notice immediately is that there is no um, object, there's nothing, right? So this is kind of like uh, just a file with a main entry point. So that is the equivalent of, in Java, you would have a, uh, a class and then public static void main. The entry point for Kotlin is just a function called main that matches this pattern, OK? So with Kotlin, that's the good thing, that I don't need to have all of these different functions as static methods of static objects. I can just have functions in a file, kind of like JavaScript. And you move away from this idea of having like these utility classes and helper classes where you have all a bunch of functions that you're adding because you don't know where else to put them, right? That problem completely disappears. It, well, it doesn't disappear. Now it goes over to files. Now you've got all of these different files and you don't know where to put your functions. But hey, we got rid of some characters in the process. So I can have another function that says print message. 
and then say um, message string and then print line uh, message and I have string interpolation so a message is okay right so you know calling the function is very straightforward just uh, print message and hello now a couple of things to notice is we're following the Pascal notation where you have the uh, parameter name and then the type okay and string interpolation as I told you you can do other things here for example do more complex things here is like say length and do operations you can do if else whatever inside of that as well yes question Uh, I think there are reasons behind it in terms of tooling and making it easier in certain aspects, the IDE. Question is, why did we choose that notation as opposed to the general job? Also, we wanted to, there, there was a, there was a, um, uh, it was actually an interesting tweet. Someone said, oh, these new languages, uh, you know, putting their uh, types after the names. Yeah, except this was done like 40 years ago, right? It, 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 it kind of is in line with those people from the JavaScript community that think functional programming is this brand new paradigm that's just been invented. Okay, anyway, I'm not going to criticize JavaScript. Maybe I should. No, I shouldn't. Right, so let me show you a little comparison. One of the things that we tried to do with Kotlin is make it less, uh, more concise, right? More concise than Java. Now, that's not saying a lot. I mean, it, it, you know, Java is quite verbose. But to give you an idea, let me go ahead and create a customer class. So I'm going to create a customer class here, and then I'm going to call it Kotlin, and I'll say customer, right? And it's going to be a class. And I'm going to remove all of this. I don't need that. And I'll say val name string, and let's go ahead and actually create a, a val id int, and var name string, and uh, we can leave it at that, right? So this is essentially creating a class that has two properties. In Kotlin, there's no such thing as a field as, as such, right? This has two properties. It has a property which is called ID, which is read-only because it's um, prefixed with, it's, it's got a vowel in front, and it's got a property called name, which is read-write, and this is also acting as a constructor, right? So I can express all of that in a single line. Now, I'm going to go ahead and add something here, a modifier called data, right? So that does a few things. What does that do? Well, let's go ahead and create a Java class, and we'll call it customer Java, right? And we'll do um, private int id, and this is going to be read-only. It's not read-only, is it? What is it? Final. Initialize, add constructor parameter, OK. Private, string name, uh, add constructor parameter, and then we're going to go ahead and create getters and setter for this. For this one, we're going to create a getter. Then we're going to come here and create a equals and hash code. And then we're going to come here and create uh, to string, and then we're going to come here and create, uh, uh, what else can we create? Override method, um, clone, okay? So that's Java. That's Kotlin, okay? So we try to be a little bit more concise. Now, of course, you're going to say, big deal. IntelliJ does that for you. Yes, it does. So essentially, we're putting ourselves out of business. Uh, no, the point here, though, is that you don't know if this code is actually just the standard template de default generated by IntelliJ or your favorite IDE, or if it's got something different, or when you add a new field or a property, you have to go and update that. Right? It's a whole lot of boiler code that you don't need. All of that is just essentially there for you with this single line. Now, I, the single, the data is what's added, the two string, the equals, the hash code, and the clone. Otherwise, it would just be a standard class with two properties. OK? Any questions? Right. 
Now let's close this off. OK, so what else do we have? So functions. Functions are very simple. As I said, they're top level. We have uh, parameters, as you've seen. You have default parameters. So this is, again, about cutting down boilerplate code. So if I have uh, two functions that take two different types of parameters, one of them, for instance, is uh, optional, I don't have to create overloads. I could just pass in a default parameter. So in this case, I have a function with three parameters. The last one has a default value of Smith. If I don't call it without passing that value in, it's going to default to Smith, right? Given I have default parameters, I also have naming of parameters. So I can now call parameters using a name as a prefix. So here I say that the default and optional parameters, as you can see, has three parameters. And I say that the second parameter is x and the first parameter is y. So I can change the order of it as well. One of the good uses of naming parameters is if you have a code base where you have functions with a lot of parameters that you can't refactor, you have to call it because it's third party or whatever, it gives you insight. In fact, if you're using, for instance, IntelliJ with Java, you might have noticed with the latest version, it also gives you kind of like a hint inside the IDE, giving you information about the, the parameter name. OK? Then, again, going to conciseness. So notice that the default return type in Kotlin is actually unit, which is similar to void, except it's an object. So I can query on it as well. And we'll see what an object is. If I don't supply the default, if I don't say unit by default, it assumes it's unit. So that would be the equivalent of void in Java. If I want to return a type, then I would just put the type here. In this case, I would be returning an int. One of the things big in Kotlin, again, is type inference. As much as we can infer, we'll try to infer. So if I want to create a parameter, I don't have to say, you know, uh, I'll create a parameter called my int, which is of type int, and it's equals 0. I don't have to do that. I can just say var my int equals 0. I don't have to be explicit about the type. The compiler will infer it. And we try and do the same everywhere. So here, for instance, I have a function that's on a single line. Essentially, what I'm doing there is just saying x equals x times 2. So it knows what type x is, and therefore it will return a type integer. I don't have to put the braces or do things like return, return, return x times 2 and do that. That would be the longer way to do it, right? If it's just a single expression that the function returns, which many functions can be, then I can just do it on a single line in that sense. OK. You can have functions with multiple parameters, any number of parameters. right? And this gets quite powerful when you start to talk about some higher order functions, which we'll see in a minute as well. So here I can pass in a, a, b, a, b, c, as many things as I would like. Now, one of the things that we try to remove in Kotlin is nulls, right? How many of you love nulls? It's like JavaScript. There's always someone in the room that loves JavaScript. There's one person that loves nulls. How many people love JavaScript? See, now there's four. OK. Same person that loves nulls loves JavaScript as well. So in Kotlin, we, re we remove null. By default, the type cannot have the value null. So when I declare a string here, for instance, uh, val uh, my string, well, this is, this is Java. Um, maybe I should do this in Kotlin. So if I say var, val, var my string equals blah, blah, right? And I say var uh, my string, so I can modify it, equals null, right? It says to me, you cannot assign to a non-null type. Right? I can have null if I want, but I have to be ex tell it that this is, can be nullable, which is basically adding a question mark at the end. So that means that this type is nullable. So now I could do my string equals null. Right? Now, when you're working with Kotlin, you usually try and avoid nulls, because you know what's the point of null if everything's going to end up being a if not null, essentially? But since we need to interoperate with Java, we have to work with the concept of nulls. Because a lot of the code that you're consuming is Java. And Java can return a customer, and that customer can be nullable. 
right? So how do I work with nulls? So here you can see that I have a typical Java code, right? If customer not null, if customer get first name is not null, if customer get first name starts with an A, um, you know, names with A are not allowed. Um, in the, this is a security exception, which is like the um, password algorithms on some websites. So customer service in Java is like that. Now with Kotlin, I can do something a little bit easier. So what I'm doing here is saying, I'm using this customer in Java, but notice that there's no null checks because it's assuming that it's not null. So I don't ever have to check for null. It's giving the developer the option of saying, this type that you're consuming from Java, is it nullable or not, right? If it is nullable, I can actually say this type is nullable. And now, I have to check for null. So you see that here it's giving me an error, right? Saying you can only do safe calls. Now instead of doing that, if customer is not null, then customer dot first name, I can just add this question mark, which is like the Elvis operator, and it just says, if it's not null, then call this. If it is null, then don't call it, right? Makes it more concise. If I want to shoot myself in the foot, I can also do that and says, I don't care that this is null, call it anyway. But this is a very important thing because when we first initially did this, we thought, okay, the idea is that anything that I consume from Java is nullable, right? Potentially nullable. So I will import everything as nullable. What would happen? We ended up with code bases of question marks everywhere. So we thought, okay, that doesn't work. Why don't they annotate code bases and say, okay, an annotation processor will run and see if it's not nullable, then it will mark that this question mark is obsolete, this check is obsolete, and therefore you don't need it, makes it a little bit cleaner. It didn't work out in the end either. So the last option was do whatever you want, right? You know best whether the type that you're consuming is nullable or not. If it is, you add the question mark. If it's not, don't add the question mark, and you don't need any extra checks. So, Working with Kotlin, you usually try and avoid nulls. But working with Kotlin in an interop scenario, you do have to sometimes deal with null. Some other things that we've tried to do to make it a little bit more uh, concise. So casting. Here is a person. Now notice that I have an open class here. Because by default, classes in Kotlin are final. That means you cannot inherit from them unless you explicitly mark them as open. And I have a class employee which inherits from person, and the employee has a property vacation days. I have a contractor that doesn't have vacation because, well, we all know we don't get vacation, or at least paid ones. Here I have a function that takes a person, and it says if the person is employee, person vacation days is less than 20. Notice what's missing there, the casting, right? It's automatically casting. That's why this is in green. You probably can't see it, but it shows up in green. Right? It's saying that it's automatically cast this to a person, an employee, because it, you've already told me, you've already made the check, and this is a, in, it's immutable, so I know that it's not going to be modified by some other thread. Therefore, I can automatically cast this for you. And it does the same thing often with nullable types as well. Okay. Now, in terms of constructing, a lot of times when you create classes, again, we try and be concise here, you have the constructor in the actual same line as the name of the class definition. Right? But you also have secondary constructors. So if I want multiple constructors, I can have them. We just call them constructor with the different parameters and then call the base constructor. If you don't have secondary constructors and you want to do some initialization code, you also have that option as well. You create this block called init, and inside init, you initialize anything you want with the constructor. But again, often you find that this isn't really necessary. So dependency injection. How many of you know dependency injection, right? Dependency injection, one of the issues with that is that when I'm initializing code, I have to make sure that it's, uh, you know, it's going to be initialized at runtime. So often when I declare a type, that type has to be nullable when I declare it because I can't initialize it with anything. We have things for that, for instance, late init, which is a modifier which I can say, you know, customer, oh, sorry, val customer, and uh, 
and that would just, um, instead of, well, the syntax doesn't matter, but it's, the point being is that you can just say, this is a late init, so I don't have to make this nullable, I don't have to have explicit code to initialize this in the constructor, and that goes to another level as well with delegation. So, here is an example of delegation. Now, I'll show you two examples. The other one we'll go back to. Interfaces, typical interfaces that you're all used to. I have a repository, and then I have a, of type, a generic type record, get by ID that returns a T, or get all that returns list of T, the most incorrect ever implementation of repositories, but that's what we all see in the wild. And then I have a customer, a, a controller class that takes a repository. Now, normally what you would do here is this would be declared here, and then you would say, you know, repository val private field uh, equals repository, right? Initialize that, and I would have to put that in some init or whatever. In Kotlin, we have first class delegation. So what we say is that this value is kind of mixed into this class and delegated to whatever is passed in here as a parameter. So notice that I have this function get all, and I have get by ID, and I'm not prefixing that with any field. I'm not doing my private repository field dot get all, my private repository field dot get by ID, because it's represented by this line here. It's saying those method calls are coming in from the parameter we're passing in as a constructor. So it's kind of like a mix-in, if you're familiar with the mix-ins in Ruby. It's mixing in that functionality inside the class, right? Now, the question that might arise here is, what happens if I have four different con the dependencies being passed in? Where do I know what method belongs to what? Get yourself a nice IDE. Kidding, though. If you have four, normally that is another sign, which is that class is probably coordinating too much. So you need to break that issue down in a different way, right? Don't pass in too many dependencies into your classes. Otherwise, they still become God classes, right? Now, we've talked about constructing. What about deconstructing? Deconstructing, again, we have things to try and make it more readable and more expressive. So here, for instance, I have a function that returns a pair. Initially, we used to have tuples so you, or tuples. So you have, you know, tuples of three values of four or five, then we reduced it to two pairs and triples, and anything beyond that, a data class. Because once you hit more than two or three parameters, you lose the semantics of what you're trying to do. So if you need more than three values, revert to a data class, which is very easy to define. But here I'm returning a pair. How do I give that some semantic meaning? So I could do something like for element in elements, print line element first and second, that doesn't give me insight into what that first and second element is. But I can deconstruct, and I can say for city, country, and elements, then print country, print city. Very similar to what you encounter in JavaScript. Okay. And you can do the same when you're creating a type or anything. And now, in fact, Kotlin also has throwaway variables. So if you've ever played with Haskell, for instance, you can actually deconstruct things and some of the, the values that you're getting, you're not using. Instead of getting hints that this variable is not used by the IDE, I can just use the underscore saying, I don't care about this value, right? How many of you love the singleton pattern? How many of you know how to implement the singleton pattern? How many of you have to look it up every time you implement the single pattern? Oh, come on, be honest. If you, are, if you know the singleton pattern by heart, then you are misusing your memory. You should use it for something else. Like, singleton patterns and regular expressions are not something you want to keep in here. There's much more valuable things in life. I always say that I want to go to my grave without learning regular expressions. So here's a singleton pattern in Kotlin. It's just an object. Because in Kotlin, we have the concept of object as a first-class citizen. So you don't, only, you don't need to create a class and then make sure that the constructor can only be invoked once and it's a private constructor, blah, blah, blah. You just declare an object. Now, I'm not saying that this means you should all go and create singleton patterns. They're not that great. 
they're read-only, they're fine. If they mutate state, they're not so good. Again, but it goes down to trying to make things as concise as possible, right? OK, now here's some things that you probably haven't seen. Because a lot of these things you can see in multiple uh, languages. And as I said at the very beginning, Kotlin is inspired by many things, right? But one thing that we have is extensions. So what does this function do? That function is hello. Can you see OK at the back there? It's a little bit late for me to ask you now, but anyway. <laughs> Wait, I'll, I'll ask you in 10 minutes. Um, what does that do? That is a function, hello, except it's prefixed with string dot dot. What does that mean? Well, actually what it's doing is extending the string class with a new function, right? So I can come, and in my main, I can say, This is me dot hello. Now any string class has that function, this is me dot hello. Well, hello, right? The extension function is similar if you know C sharp, it's the same concept as C sharp. They call them method extensions. Although in C sharp you have to create a class with a static class and a static method and then pass in this as the first parameter here, you just prefix it with the name of the class. I can access the instance of the class I'm extending. I can pass in parameters to the class I'm extending, right? Now watch this. This is Joe. This should equal this. If we come here, that's understandable because I'm saying should equal takes a value and compares it to the actual instance. And in fact, this could be simplified like that, right? But it's got this other little thing here called infix. And that allows me to call it in this way. This should equal this, right? One of the key things we wanted to accomplish with Kotlin was the ability to create DSLs easily. DSLs that you can create easily simply in your subdomain and use them without having to l understand ASTs or a whole bunch of language um, theory. And some of these things that you'll see now are what allow us to have this ability. Okay. So the extension functions allow me to extend any class. I can extend a Java class. I can extend a Kotlin class with any functionality that I want. The infix allows me to create an, a function that can be called in infix notation as long as it's a function that uh, is an extension function or a member function that has a single parameter. Now, the standard library comes with a whole bunch of things. So here, for instance, I create, and again, look at the inference in Kotlin. You know, they're, they're, I don't have to be explicit. I have a list of albums, list of tracks, then I have multiple albums, nothing around all of this explicitness around types, et cetera. If I want to declare a list of numbers, 1 to 30. If I want to declare a, a, an array of words, array of, and then all of the different type, words. Capitals, list of Madrid to Spain, London to UK, Berlin to Germany, Washington DC to USA. What is this to? Can anybody tell me? What is it? It's an infix function, right? Where is this defined? In the standard library. So instead of me having to do this more explicit Madrid-Spain pair, this actually creates a pair for me, makes it more expressive, right? And the standard library comes with a whole bunch of functions. So filter, filter, you know, on numbers. We follow the groovy convention as well that if a lambda expression consists of a single parameter, I can refer to that parameter using it instead of being explicit. So I could say, you know, um, my even numbers equals numbers filter, and then it would be a function that um, you know is divisible by two modulus two equals zero. So the pairs. But first of all, in Kotlin, each of these fun uh, a lambda expression. This is a lambda expression, right? That's how you do a lambda expression in Kotlin. It could be multi-line, right? 
And if the first parameter is, if it's a single parameter, I can replace the explicit definition of it, explicit declaration of it, with it. So that's where that comes from. OK? That's like Groovy. I have all of these functions like map. And if you look through the standard library, the majority of these are extension functions on generic types. So you get map, filter, flat map, sorted, sort by, uh, group by, group, all of these different things on all of the different correct collections, array list, list, whatever you want. Uppercase, lowercase, all of these different things. This comes all part of the standard library. So the higher order, of course, I can create my own higher order functions as well. So here I have a higher order function. A higher order function, if you're not familiar with the term, We've just used it with filter. Filter is a higher order function. Higher order function is a function that takes a function or a function that returns a function. Right? Now you know functional programming. There you go. A higher order function. This is a function that takes an integer and an integer and returns an integer. Right? I invoke that. I say print line func 2, 3. How do I call that? Higher order my sum. I can reference functions by name similar to how you can do in Java now on a type. So my sum is a function that takes two parameters of type int and returns an int. So matches the pattern that I'm expecting here. Now, one of the things that I showed you around being able to do multi-line with the lambdas, one of the benefits that that has is that we try it, again, not only with the DSL, but try and make Kotlin extensible as much as possible. And how many of you know the try with resources? In C Sharp, there's this thing called using, which basically is similar. I take an object that is uh, I disposable, and it automatically disposes it. I say using this object, open braces, do whatever, and automatically disposes. Kind of similar to try with resources. I don't have that in Java. I don't have that in uh, Kotlin, but it's very easy to create. I create a function called using that takes an object that's closable and a body, an action. And I say try, execute that action, finally close it off, right? So when I want to use this, I can do something like using my closable, done, right? And it looks like it's a keyword, right? It looks like it's part of the language. It looks like it's a construct of the language, but it essentially isn't. It's just a function. And if you're familiar with asynchronous programming, uh, Rx, Java, the keywords in C Sharp around the sync await, we, all have, we have all of those in Kotlin as well. They're called coroutines. It's implemented in a generic way called coroutines. And none of the solutions, a sync await, or any of these things that we provide yield, if you're familiar with the, with the keyword yield, they're not part of the language. They're just functions. But because of the sum of the conventions and the abilities that we have with Kotlin, it feels like it's part of the language. So what else? Sequences. A lot of the things that you saw, like when I take a list of numbers and I do a filter and then I do a map, that's all eager evaluation. That means it's going to go through the entire list, it's going to evaluate everything, and then it's going to print out the result. A lot of times now we want to work with lazy evaluation, which means basically process data until we find what we're looking for and then discard the rest. You can do that in Java with streams. In Kotlin, it used to be called streams. And then because of Java coming out with streams, we kind of changed it and we call it sequences. So now I can take any collection and say as sequence. And as soon as I do that, any operation after that becomes lazy. So it's lazily evaluated. And last but not least, in terms of coding, algebraic data types. Okay? So if you're familiar with this, this is very common in languages such as Haskell, for instance. An algebraic data type is essentially a type that could be of one type or another type, Boolean, for instance. Right? Here I have a page result that can be a type success or a type error. So you see that the class success inherits from page result. The class error inherits from page result. If it's successful, I want my class to contain some property called uh, the URL. If it's an error, I want it to return, uh, have a code and a message. Now, forget this seal word, 
sealed word here. I'll tell you what that is. So now when I do like, when I do calling page, result equals get page. Now, when the result is success, print line, URL. And again, notice that this is automatically casted to the return type. When the result is error, print line, message, right? It's a much nicer, cleaner way to do write code because I don't have to return an object that has everything, whether it's a result, a successful or an error, and then say, if error on that property, then you know, make use of these properties. If not, make use of those other properties. So this is just basically a subclass of the type page result. What's the sealed keyword in here? That's saying that this is it. In a hierarchical way, no other class is ever going to be inherited from page result. Yes? No. That's different. That's open. So open, by default, it's final, right? Sealed means that no other class outside of these two are going to be inheriting from page result. So it's limiting the, 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 the inheritance scope. Right now, up to Kotlin 1.0, you had to define it as part of the, the class, so like a, a child class. But now, you can actually put it inside the same file. As long as it's inside the same file, it's OK. And if you combine this, all of the condition, all of this conditional statements like if, when, et cetera, they all return, they can be used as expressions as well. So if I say return, right, because it's not, I mean, I have to, um, you see it says add else branch or add remaining branch. Because I, well, I, I don't even have a return type. But if you use it as a, a return value, if you return a value from the when, then it becomes an exhaustive check because then they'll say, you know, you're not taking into account all of the different instances. Okay, so that's enough with code. Let's go back to slides a little bit and just finish off with some things. Some other things that people are doing, Anko is if you're doing Android development, that's kind of like a DSL for creating views without having to deal with XML. Android extensions makes use of some other technology that we have in Kotlin, which is called the uh, plugin for the compiler. So what it does, it actually, gets information about your elements on your Android forms and statically types them for you. So you can refer to them by name without having to do a find by ID with the string, et cetera. Spring Boot, um, Spring is a very big advocate of Kotlin now. They're using it extensively, and Spring Boot now supports Kotlin natively. And you, it has Kotlin extensions. It makes use of a lot of things. COBOL's already mentioned. This is a DSL for uh, writing build in Kotlin. And of course, Gradle recently announced, well, recently, no, or nearly a year ago, announced that now they support Kotlin. So you can write your Gradle script in Kotlin. It's called Gradle, Co Gradle script Kotlin instead of using Groovy. And they recommend Kotlin for any new plugins as well. Coming in 1.1, all of those things are there because 1.1 has already been released. For you, the next steps, go to kotlinlang.org, try kotlinlang.org, and Kotlin koans, you can download them offline, play with them, learn the language. Books, there's a whole bunch of books. These are just two. These are already published. If you're doing Kotlin for Android, recommend the book on the left, Kotlin in Action. I've got an O'Reilly course if you're interested. I also have a podcast now called Talking Kotlin. Self-publicity there. Community is very, very large, very active, very nice. Um, we've got about, I think, close to 7,000 people now on our Slack. Don't tell Slack, because they don't like open source projects. Um, on the free tier, they'll love it on the paid tier, of course. Um, so, but yeah, very active on the Slack channel, right? So you can join the Slack channel and then die with a 1,000 deaths of Slack channels inside Slack channels. And also, I wanted to mention, with their permission, Trifork, because they're helping organize this, we're having a Kotlin conference in San Francisco. So if you're interested in that, that's going to be a two-day event on November the 2nd and 3rd. Very cheap, beautiful. It's going to be big. <laughs> I promised I wouldn't do that. Anyway, summary. So I hope you get the essence of this, that this, the goal with this was to be a pragmatic language. A lot of the choices that we have made is to make it easy to uh, solve some of the problems that we face in daily development. Very easy learning curve, 
The interoperability allows low risk adoption because you can add it to your code base gradually. You don't need to start with tests. You know, any Java class can be called from Kotlin and any Kotlin class can be called from Java. And this is obviously a very subjective thing, but um, empirical evidence based on my biases has proven that it is extremely enjoyable by everyone that I ask, okay? <laughs> And Kotlin is here to stay, and this is a very big important point because we have a lot invested in Kotlin. And we didn't make Kotlin to sell consulting around Kotlin or sell programming around Kotlin. We created Kotlin for us, for our tooling, and our tooling is our main source of income. And, you know, we're going to continue to sell tools, and Kotlin has now become one of our tools, except we use it ourselves and we give it away free in the hope that you guys will all buy IntelliJ IDEA, which eventually, hopefully. And to sum up, you know, someone tweeted, and with their permission, I, I'm showing it. They said he researched Kotlin last night and then spending the morning looking at mountains of boilerplate Java in Android Studio. I see why they did it. Pretty much that. That's, that's, that's a good summary of why we did this. Thank you. And we have one minute for questions. No questions? Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. So the question is, when I extend string, where does that, how does that impact? So essentially, as long, it's, it's based on a package level scope. So when you define your package, which by default is default package, but you can explicitly define a package in Kotlin, we follow the same um, conventions as Java, you know, the, the death by a thousand subfolders. Um, except you don't need to have them in subfolders. Uh, but it's basically on the scope. So when you're inside the IDE, if you write like, you know, a string dot hello, the IDE is going to pick it up and say, oh, there's a hello defined in this package, and it'll show you the IntelliSense. Then you hit enter, and it'll import the package for you. All right? Class overrides, member function overrides the extension function as well. Yes? A data, so the question is, Static versus instances. Everything I've done is essentially an, uh, a, a, a class as you know it in Java, right? A data class is a class in Java. You have to create an instance of it. Uh, yes, I actually didn't show how to create an instance of something. Val, val customer equals customer. There's no key, new keyword, okay? That's how you create an instance, right? The only thing that's not an instance is object. I mean, sorry, the only thing that you don't create an instance of is object because that's already its own instance. Singleton. Okay. Yes. Yeah, the question is, when would you use Scala? When would you use Kotlin? General answer is, if you're happy with Scala, there's nothing for you in Kotlin. Simple as that, right? If you're unhappy with Scala, take a look at Kotlin. Scala is very powerful. Uh, it allows you many things. In Kotlin, we don't. We don't allow you to override any um, symbol, define any operator. We limit you in what you can do. We do that intentionally, so that often we don't end up with the complexity that we, that we do. So the question is around Java with Scala interop. It's, it's very, very smooth. And don't take our word for it. Ask on the internet. Ask on Slack. It's very, very smooth. Because remember, we had, when we started, we had 10 years of legacy code. We now have 17 years of Java legacy code. Like, we're dogfooding this every day. So we emphasize a lot the interoperability. Yeah, so we're very, the question is around the explicitness around the types for functions, right? Function yeah, parameters. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Explicit, yes. Explicit, yes. yes. Yeah, no, we're explicit around that because that also helps in terms of optimizations and compiler speed times. I th yeah, go ahead. Last question because I think we've got to go. Yes. You can, the question is around testing. You can use the existing testing frameworks, absolutely. In fact, there's even more awesome frameworks. One of them is called um, spec, spec Framework, which if you're familiar with Jasmine or um, Mocha, uh, is essentially that. Um, and it, it allows you to do kind of like a very nice uh, style of testing. Um, it is really, really nice. Why? Because I'm the author, well, original. and. Um, one of the, now there's three of us maintaining it, so you can see that I can do, for example, describe a calculator, it should return, it should return, right? But I'm going to be completely fair. There's also another one called Kotlin Test, which is our competitor. 
He's doing a great job as well, the author. And that is kind of like an implementation of Scala test in Kotlin. So that also a lot. I did not pay for keywords there. So that when they do Kotlin test, spec shows up. Some, some people actually do that. Um, so this is another one, right? And this, this has its own kind of assertion framework, right? Spec doesn't. We use Hamcrest or a whole bunch of different things. Um, but this does have its own kind of expectations and things, right? So there's already a lot of stuff around that area. One of the things that we're going to do with spec, though, is we're going to try and decouple completely from JUnit so that essentially you're going to be able to use spec when you target JavaScript, native, or JVM. Right, that's it for time. I'm here the three days, so if you want, come around, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you.